Yepuchka would like to have a new computer? Yes, very much. Why so? Because this is slow. Like yeah. my brain. <laughs> Here's the deal guys, uh, we need an editing workstation for Premiere and After Effects and we don't want to spend a fortune for it, uh, in fact we want it as cheap as possible. This is what we actually want to replace, a 10 year old system, 2700K Sandy Bridge, amazing, one of the best CPUs of its time and it still is great but uh, for editing of 4K videos, yeah it's not sufficient enough, you need something better. 32 gigabytes of RAM, which might even sound reasonable but doesn't work. The RAM itself, the DDR3, pretty slow one. It works, it's just like for big projects it's not enough. And two SSDs, 840 EVO and 850 EVO, which are fine but the size is not big enough and the speed as well is not good enough, so yeah, I need to replace that as well with the NVMe drives. Let me show you what it actually means. So this is the CPU 4 and 4, it's overclocked. We are launching the Premiere project which is a huge one. CPU seems fine, see 100. Whenever CPU is 100, it's already bad. And now the project is starting to load. Check the memory. You see what happens to the memory? Uh, it goes up and up and up. In four out of five times, the system crashes because it's not enough memory. That's what you might actually expect when you have 32 gigabytes of memory, but uh, the project is huge, like two hours of footage, and this is not even 4K. It looks like it crashed. I don't see any errors, but the system does not respond. So in many cases, you can see like errors from Premiere, which says like your memory is full, proceed with caution. Sometimes it freezes like this. Sometimes it does not respond, then it responds, and then it freezes. So you, you never know. So it, it's, it's really a pain in the ass. 32 gigabytes, it's for many people it's enough, but you see if you have a huge project and even this project is split into two. We had a huge project, we had to split it into two, so sometimes it's possible to work on it, like not apparently not this time. So try it one more time. Seems like this actually opened, which is very good. This project is a little bit smaller. We got lucky this time, but not every time is like that. That's the reason for the upgrade. And this is full HD. What about 4K? Let's check how 4K HEVC works. Let's see. So I've added 4K HEVC. The CPU is completely destroyed. Check the footage. Doesn't even play. Delay. Now it seems to work and now it's slow-mo. <laughs> yeah, the CPU cannot manage this. Not possible. 100% all the way up. And this used to be a pretty good processor back in the day. This is the system disassembled. 8888 gigabytes of RAM, which is pretty rare for DDR3. Like this, the total maximum capacity this motherboard can handle. Even this is not enough, so we have to upgrade to 64 and 128 probably. Which means we need a new motherboard, yes. We discarded the new DDR5 platforms. They cost considerably more than we can afford for this particular build. AMD Zen 2 platform was chosen because it currently is very cheap and still is relatively fresh. It provides amazing performance and uh, the power consumption per dollar is amazing as well. Also, we already own a few AM4 platforms. If needed, we can swap components really quickly. CPU. We chose a 12-core AMD 3900X, which costs costs us around $220, so why not the 16-core processor at like 3950X? Well, having four extra cores is nice, uh, but a used 3950X costs uh, anywhere from 20 to 30% more, but the uplift in actual performance particularly for Premiere, is only about 4%. 3950X gives about 13% better render export times, but video export isn't really something that we need, since our goal is mainly editing and then exporting the video in the very end, so if the export is a couple minutes longer, uh, that's totally fine for us. For the sole purpose of editing, the 25% difference in price is not justified. Architecturally, 3900X and 3950X are the same. The only difference is the number of cores. 
if your use case is different and you do a lot of, uh, let's say, 3D modeling or you do a lot of rendering where your computer does these tasks for hours or maybe in some cases days and you have to wait a long time for that. So in that case, yes, four extra cores uh, makes sense. It may be worth it. Uh, moreover, a Threadripper in that case may be worth it, uh, but that's a discussion for a different day. We could have saved even more money by going one tier lower with 3800X, which has 8 instead of 12 cores. For the video editing that would totally work, uh, we would have saved an additional 30% of the processor price by losing about 8% in performance for editing and 20% for video experts. But having even fewer cores uh, poses a slight risk for tasks where Adobe After Effects integration is needed and uh, you want to mess with both Premiere and After Effects at the same time and it usually happens through the dynamic link. So for that case, you do actually need a little bit more cores. So having a top tier, uh, well, almost a top tier 12 core system is very nice. We don't want to have an 8 core system. You can totally get away with 8 cores with 3800X, uh, but if you can afford an extra $50, having 12 instead of 8 cores uh, seems worth it. 16 instead of 12 seems not worth it in our case, but 12 is it's a good middle ground there. At the same time, we wouldn't recommend going lower than eight cores for the editing workstation with something like 3600X, a six core processor. Uh, it may become a bottleneck even just for basic Premiere 4K editing. Same goes for the 5900X and 5950X. Uh, because they are newer, uh, they may cost from 20 to 30% more and 5950X sells for around $350 currently. Zen 3, the architecture of this processor, is similar to Zen 2 and provides a relatively marginal performance boost of about like 2% to 5% depending on the actual editing task you're doing. They share the same amount of cores. The only difference is like slightly optimized cache architecture and some better boost clocks. For our specific task, money is more important and we chose the Zen 2 architecture. A CPU cooler. Since this is a budget build, for those of you who want to buy a cooler, we recommend a Phantom Spirit, or if you can't find it, a Peerless Assassin. Those provide cooling performance on par with venerable NHD 15, and they cost only a fraction of it. So yeah, that's a good choice if you can find it. And the AMD's proprietary Wraith Prism uh, will get the job done as well. If you can get it at no charge with the processor included, please do so. We were promised a Wraith cooler with our 3900X uh, when we ordered it used, but unfortunately, it turned out to be a much less potent Wraith Stealth model. I, we don't know how it got there, but it was there. It's a 65 TDP watts cooler and much less potent it's good, it's stealth, so it means like it's smaller, but uh, it was actually designed for Ryzen 6 core processors. We'll test it anyway, but we needed to order something better, so we obtained a Thermalrite Macho for like $27. It wasn't a particular choice, but it was being sold by the same guy who sold us the motherboard, so it was much easier and cheaper to buy and ship from the same source. And the cooler itself is quite good also. Probably wouldn't buy it if it was new, but uh, yeah, since it was the same guy selling them, we just got it. And it's a budget build, so $27, it can't be that. I have to attach this stock fan, aluminium heatsink, which will not work with this CPU. I think I'll down clock it or something to make it at least boot and somewhat work. Here's what's interesting. The AMD Wraith Stealth, the one I've got, which is only 65 watt TDP cooler, is apparently not enough for 3900X. However, it was plenty enough to install Windows. It's even enough to be browsing in Windows, in Google Chrome and everywhere else. And check this out. Temperature is 41. Temperature is more than good. Cinebench works now. Yeah, now the CPU is 93, 95, almost close to the limit. So yeah, it's not capable to cope. However, you see the speed is still fine, 3900s. Yeah, CPU was 95, the test ended, so it was a definite throttle, beginning to throttle. That's bad. However, you see it was even enough for this test. You can even use this system, I wanna say. Yeah, I wouldn't use it for something like rendering, but to browse, to use applications that do not load up your CPU too bad, it's actually fine. Either. So the stress test is on. If you run this for 
extended periods of time, it inevitably will lead to down clocking your CPU. So we reached the limit 95, the clock went down, it's 38 already, and it will be going down. There are some rendering applications like Adobe renders of, that may do this, 3D Mark renders, 3D S Max renders. So there are applications that can do it. And especially since this is a workstation, it's important. The test is actually success. It's possible, it's just not recommended. And you will get less frequency while reaching the limit, which is expected. However, very interestingly, the game test, the Tomb Raider, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and we're doing it on the same system. It's totally fine, as you can see. 58 degrees and the CPU load is about 12 to 15 percent and this is actually very great so it means like if you want a game if you do something light on your system you don't want to render you don't want to load up like 100 percent of your CPU you can actually get away with this cooler which is not recommended we still not recommended but if you really have to you don't have anything else you can do it the actual game test they load up your GPU not the CPU of course it will depend on the game each game is different but as you can see this is totally fine. Let's install something more appropriate and see if anything changes. And by something much more appropriate, I mean something like this. And of course, quite predictable, the temps are nowhere near as close to 95, 20 degrees lower and the frequency is higher. So that's great, but that's expected. That's a much bigger and better cooler. Is Wraith Stealth recommended for long run? Well. Not really, you better get a decent cooler. However, as a short-term solution, it totally works. The NVMe architecture is uh, preferable for this kind of build. We could get away with SATA, but uh, the performance hit we take and price difference aren't really worth it, uh, considering how cheap the NVMe's have gotten. If you need some extra storage for archiving and for backups, SATA works just fine. Uh, you can do it, but uh, for editing, NVMe is better. It is a budget build, uh, but we still wanted to perform on par with some high-end builds. Premiere and After Effects are kind of peculiar when it comes to storage. Uh, these applications pervasively cache assets. This means they constantly override big volumes of data over and over again. The general best practice is one SSD for your operating system and all of your installs. One SSD specifically designated for just for Adobe Cache and one SSD for video footage. It means you need to buy three drives, uh, which is expensive. Uh, moreover, drives tend to have a terabyte written rating, so buying a used drive is not really an option here. You have a very good chance of buying a depleted drive. Uh, unless you buy it from a friend and you know for sure that that drive hasn't been used intensely uh, specifically considering we know that people mine some crypto coins with their drives so it's preferable to get a new drive after all like imagine what happens if it fails you risk really a lot if it fails so better to have a new one that does not fail storage amount will highly depend on your specific needs on your projects uh, generally speaking 500 gigabytes for a system drive is enough at least now in 2024 another 500 gigabytes is enough for adobe cache and the footage drive will depend on the amount of your actual footage and assets. In our case, one terabyte does the job. Uh, we shoot mostly HEVC, uh, very rarely ProRes, and uh, the projects are medium sized for up to like two hours in length. Uh, these are actually the videos you can see on this channel, but your personal video size requirements may be very different, so it depends on your project. Maybe you need more than one terabyte. We replaced two 500 gigabyte drives with one one terabyte drive. It means that this drive will be utilized both for the operating system and for the Adobe cache. It is an acceptable compromise. It's not as good as having a dedicated drive for cache, but considering that two 500 gigabyte drives costs like $60 each, and one one terabyte drive costs $90, uh, we saved $30 there, not much, but still we saved it. And uh, we need our motherboard to support two M.2 slots instead of three M.2 slots, uh, which actually broadens the selection of motherboards quite immensely. We do lose a few percent in performance because system files and cache files uh, will be on the same physical NVMe stick uh, sharing the same controller, but the loss is very marginal. It was pretty serious back in the day when we used HDDs, uh, but now it's just history you now and the newer NVMe drives have fully fixed this gap. The controllers are fully capable right now to handle both system files and Adobe cache files on the same drive, given uh, you actually buy something decent and you don't buy a cheap drive, which can 
cannot handle it, and that may happen as well. There is also an added benefit of having one big drive instead of two small drives. By having one combined drive, we may have 700 gigabytes for cache and 300 gigabytes for system files or vice versa. So we may shift the amount left or right, which is good. It may be not needed for many people. They may just buy huge drives like four terabyte for each and they'll be fine. But since this is a budget build, right, this is a good bonus. The downside is that this drive will wear down quicker. The operating system itself it uses a lot of temporary files, plus the Adobe cache, it constantly harasses it every time. But if we monitor the terabyte written rating and we regularly check for health status, we'll be fine for years. This brings us to the vendor chosen. In our case, it's Samsung. Its proprietary magician software is very nifty at monitoring drives and we really like it. For this build, we chose 980 Pro, which turned out to be only like $10 more expensive than the 970 EVO Plus. The 970 EVO Plus would work totally just fine and you can get this as well. But if it's like the same price, get the Pro. It has a little bit better controller. But Samsung isn't really a requirement. You may get something like Crucial P5 Plus or maybe T500 Western Digital Black or uh, SK Hynix Gold P31, that one is a really good one. And it will work as long as they use TLC chip architecture, at least for the operating system drive and cache drive. The video footage drive can get away with a QLC architecture design, which is not as durable, but it costs like two thirds the price. So if price is an issue, you may get QLC for the assets drive, but uh, don't get it for the system drive. That, that's not a good idea. It's not reliable enough. Just don't pay too much attention to sequential read and write numbers. Those rarely make any sense for like day to day usage, as well as PCIe generation. Gen 3 is perfectly fine for our low budget workstation. Even for the high budget workstation, Gen 3 is still fine. Like going for Gen 4 or Gen 5 with this type of a budget build is pointless, makes no sense. It makes sense only in case when you don't pay too much extra for it. If you can get it for the same price as Gen 3, you may go with Gen 4 and 5. But again, those Gen 4 and Gen 5, they mean usually only for the sequential reads and writes. And sequential reads and writes, uh, like we really hate this marketing thing that is going on. It makes very little sense. It makes sense for people who transfer loads of files on regular basis all the time and even then, like those files have to be one big, huge piece so it can go as a sequential. If you have a lot of small files, it will not work. And during editing, it does not work because editing uses a lot of small files and uses a lot of random accesses. So controller means a lot. So a good controller with Gen 3 will perform much better than like a mediocre controller with Gen 4 or 5. Get whatever is cheaper with a good controller motherboard so we chose b550 for two reasons it's cheaper than x570 and it still supports most of the features the x570 does it has no fan it means that it has no noise unlike the x570 except it has fewer pcie lanes but for our purposes for our workstation this will work just fine uh, the aorus b550 master board it's a complete overkill for this build the reason we got it was that we found a used one locally for 160 dollars which is a very good price for this board arguably the best board produced for this chipset along probably with msi mag unify but we don't recommend it since it's a budget build don't go for these boards uh, motherboard selection will greatly depend on your specific needs of connectivity and ports but generally choose something that has two m.2 slots and something from aorus msi mag or asus rog lineups these lineups are premium but uh, they are much better built they use better components and uh, they are designed to sustain loads uh, you may get away with something cheap like gigabyte ultra durable asus prime or msi pro but uh, those use lower layer count pcbs and they quite often overheat and they are notorious for not being stable with high clocks it's not like you're going to overclock but uh, try not to cut corners when selecting motherboard get something at least half decent it's very tempting to get something super cheap like b450 that costs like 60 dollars and it may even work but the risk of encountering problems further along the road are very high uh, b550 aorus elite uh, ax v2 seems to be reasonably priced and can be found on various sales it's not as cool as the b550 master of course yeah but it still checks most of the boxes and it's also considerably cheaper even when you buy it new 
In our case, Aorus B550 Master has three M.2 ports in PCIe 4 mode, but two of those share the bandwidth with a GPU slot, which is a bad idea if you were to build a gaming PC and wanted to use many M.2 drives, but for our editing workstation it's uh, irrelevant. Our GPU will never saturate the PCIe bandwidth anyway. You need something like RTX 4090 to fill the difference and even that you will fill during the game and you will not fill the difference during the editing audio. B550 Master motherboard turned out to have a very decent sound, which is relatively okay for monitoring. We will skip buying the audio interface this time, but if you aren't satisfied with your motherboard, you may obtain something like Arturia Minifuse, which is relatively cheap for about like $100, and provides a studio-like sound. So this step isn't needed and can be skipped, but if you need a better sound, you can buy it. The onboard audio of your motherboard can be used, but uh, very often Often with cheap motherboards uh, when paired with any like basic monitoring headphones like Sony MDR7506 like the industry standard or Audio Technica M50 the onboard audio DAC DAC was like a digital to analog converter basically your sound card it, it sounds very flat in those cheap motherboards uh, it gets the job done but the lack of proper fidelity in audio processing may be a hindrance to some audio centric creators it may be it may not be this is the optional step It's definitely not a must for this budget build to have an audio interface like arturia but having a good audio interface is nice plus you may use some pro grade microphones with it like uh, shure sm7b otherwise you cannot use them with your build but uh, if you get a decent board like in our case b550 master we are okay with the sound so it's good for monitoring so it depends on your needs and what type of creator you are as for the headphones the aforementioned sony or audio technica will be the perfect match for any editing machine and you cannot skip this step those headphones they are not expensive audio is very important for the final edit and uh, like emotion comes through ears that, that is true you do need a neutral sounding pair of good decent monitoring headphones monitoring speakers will cost much more than headphones so like paying 90 dollars for sony 7506 for a pair of good decent headphones is a very good investment they will last for many years let me show you something. This is Sony MDR-V6 and I used them for 10 years. They are broken. I replaced the cable many times. I replaced the pads, but I still use them. So it's a very good piece of equipment. Not my main headphones right now. Yeah, I use the Biodynamics. You can see the videos on this channel, but yeah, these headphones are great, especially considering how, how little they cost actually, yeah, like $90 and the Biodynamics like $600. So yeah, it can't beat $90. Adobe has added a GPU based acceleration, which can reduce export times by up to five. And live playback also now is capable of leveraging your GPU unlike sometime before where it did not use it at all. However, it does not mean you need to buy a top end GPU. I know it's tempting to do so, but it's not needed. We'll be using a GeForce GTX 970, a very old card, because we already own this card, that's why we'll be using it, but it's outdated and it only has 4GB of VRAM. It is advisable to get a relatively modern card with 6GB of RAM at least. GTX 1060 Ti can be considered as a bare minimum, but it's better and more future-proof to get something like RTX 3060 at least. Yeah, there is no point chasing flagships like 3090 or 4090. They are marginally better for editing, uh, for Adobe products at least, but and they cost a fortune. So yeah, something middle ground, 60 series, 3060 will work, or maybe 4060 if you can afford it. The more memory, the better. AMD GPUs aren't recommended though. Uh, Adobe and DaVinci Resolve work better with Nvidia cards. It's just fact, unfortunately, yeah get nvidia card for the pc case uh, we'll be using a cooler master half 912 plus because we already own it it was purchased together with the sandy bridge platform more like 10 years ago but any mid tower atx box will suffice uh, just make sure it has a decent intake fan and a decent exhaust cooling isn't something very important in this build uh, since our gpu and cpu are relatively cool but having two main fans is a must in any pc system so they make Make sure you have something in front and something from the back and make sure it's, it blows decently. 
power supply. The system we are building won't be power hungry, so any decent 650 gold rated PSU will suffice for this build. We'll be using a Seasonic Prime Titanium 750 watts because we already have one. It has been a terrific piece of equipment and uh, we have to admit it, it's pretty expensive thing. Good alternatives would be Seasonic Focus or EVJ Supernova. Don't go too cheap with the PSU. Similar to a motherboard, it's responsible for overall stability and reliability of your system. Uh, you may buy a Seasonic used, uh, they have amazing 10 year warranty for the ram we recommend uh, at least two sticks by 32 gigabytes each together 64 uh, preferably 3600 rated uh, with cast latency something around 16 or 18 but if the price is steep the latency of like 20 or 22 will work just fine corsair gskill team group micron any brand will work in our particular case, we'll be installing four 6x16 each of Ballistics Max modules because we own them already. Otherwise, it's not a very sensible option. This RAM is expensive and since it's like four 6x16 each, we populate all of the four slots that we have. Taking two modules by 32 each gives you room for future upgrades extension to 128 which may be needed for some particularly big projects so having four sticks of 16 not a good idea no a detailed review and ddr 4 oc guide of the ballistics max and just kill samsung bd ram is coming as well uh, so that's why we already own this ram that's why we are already using it because we have it because it was purchased for the review purposes so that's the reason but for you specifically buy 2x32 or 4x32 whatever works if you need to decide whether you need 2x32 or 4x32, if you need 64 or 128 gigabytes of memory, you will need to check out this new video it will be coming after this video. So we'll be giving a great, huge explanation which memory is better for what. Mm, the sound of freshly installed RAM kits. Sounds so awesome, especially if it's a high quality motherboard. As per the monitor, uh, 1080p IPS LG 24EA53, a very old thing we already own, uh, which can be currently bought for as low as like $50. We already own it, but we checked the prices, it's very cheap. It has like 87.7 of sRGB coverage, which is bad, it's very bad, but uh, not as bad as comparably priced TN or VA panels. Uh, when looking for a monitor, uh, try to buy something that is close to 95 or 100% of sRGB coverage, so that's what you need to be looking for. You don't have to go as cheap as with it, uh, you may get something bigger uh, with better resolution, but make sure it's an IPS panel and uh, make sure the color accuracy is relatively good. 60 Hz is fine, you don't need any high refresh numbers. So the system switched on which is very good because sometimes when you buy parts that are used there is always a risk it will not run or something is broken or like you never know like the reputation of the seller is important but you never know it is good do you like the new system do you like the new system works fine <laughs> oh, we got a couple extra coolers here and there, so the system looks a little bit prettier. And right off the bat, the 4K video, which was impossible to load 150 megabits per second HEVC. Let's check how it works now. Smooth. That is very smooth. Amazing. The CPU usage is about 30%. 30% is still a lot, but. Now it's a fully usable system. Amazing. And now let's open a project which is about three hours long. We had to split it into two parts on the old PC because it couldn't even open it. It crashed all the time and uh, yeah, we see it opened. CPU was about 50%, memory is 21. It opened and it works just great. No crashes, everything loaded up, everything works perfectly fine by the way check out this amazing travel video about greece link in the description how was the editing experience amazing i'm news? so happy really so, so is it faster or what it's without any problem much easier to use 
So in general, uh, these are all of the things we could assemble. It doesn't mean that this build is the best and it's optimal specifically for you. This is just some guidance. You may be using Intel platform, but uh, specifically for this generation, AMD proved to be a little bit better, had more cores, uh, less temperatures, and in general, this is the third system, it's the third AMD system we are buying. Maybe next gen DDR5, when the new NVIDIA cards come around, and new AMD processors come around, the next eight or nine series, maybe things will change, maybe Intel will be better, but for this specific build, yeah, we think AMD is still better, considering you're buying everything used as well, so this means a lot. Mm. A little bit of water helps a lot. Let's call it a day. Let's do so. So the way it should work, it would, oh shit. Take everything with a grain of salt. Consider all of your specific use cases. Adjust everything, tweak everything. As always, thanks for watching guys. We'll see you on the next one. That one with the memory. Yeah, that will be interesting.